So Weber fractures are one of the most common fractures you're gonna see in your physiotherapy clinic. In this video, we're gonna highlight what they are, how we classify them, how they're managed orthopedically, and some top tips that you can use in your physiotherapy clinic to help these patients. Let's get it. Hey guys, I'm Khalid, welcome back to Clinical Physio. So a Weber fracture is a fracture of the distal fibula at the ankle joint. Let's dive into some anatomy and look at this in more detail. So let's take a look at the bones of the ankle and there are three in particular to pay attention to. The tibia, which sits on the medial side, the fibula, which sits on the lateral side, and the talus, which sits inferiorly to these two. And as we said earlier, it is a fracture of the distal fibula that represents a Weber fracture. And that can be anywhere from the lower third line to the distal tip of the fibula, which is the lateral malleolus. Now the joint between these three bones is the talocrural joint. And we can see how the talus sits really nicely in the gap between the tibia and the fibula. And this is often referred to as a mortis lock joint because of how snugly the talus fits between these two bones. When that mortis lock is disrupted, it can have big implications for our Weber fractures. Now, another crucial bit of anatomy to tell you about is the distal syndesmosis or the tibiofibular syndesmosis. This is a series of ligaments around the distal ankle which effectively hold the tibia and fibula together. By holding these two bones together, the syndesmosis maintains stability of the ankle joint during weight bearing. If syndesmosis is injured, it really compromises stability of the ankle because it means that that tibia and fibula get separated, meaning that the talus now runs a little bit more freely. It's out of that mortis lock position that we talked about earlier. Ki, Jang and Porter did a study in 2017 and they found that syndesmosis injuries occurs in 71% of all patients that have a Weber fracture. So that's quite a high percentage, meaning that that stability is affected in a high percentage of patients. So Weber fractures are classified into Weber A, Weber B or Weber C fractures based on the position of the fracture on the fibula relative to the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis. So a Weber A fracture is one where the fracture line is inferior to the syndesmosis and is therefore sometimes called an infrasyndesmotic fracture. Weber A fractures are the easiest to treat by standard because of the idea that the fracture is contained within the joint without much ligament disruption. And therefore, we commonly see that these are managed conservatively. A Weber B fracture describes a fracture of the fibula which is in line with the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis and is therefore often called a transsyndesmotic fracture. Now, because of that position, it can mean disruption to the syndesmosis. And Q, Zhang and Porter from 2017 found that syndesmosis injuries occur 55% of the time when it comes to a Weber B fracture. Naturally, that can mean instability for the ankle and that can have an impact on management as we'll see later. Then we have our Weber C fractures, which are described when the fracture of the fibula is above or superior to the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis and thus is sometimes called a suprasyndesmotic fracture. These are the most unstable of the three and Q Zhang and Porter 2017 found that a syndesmosis injury occurs 100% of the time when the patient has a Weber C fracture. Therefore, it can also guarantee that there is going to be an element of ankle instability when this fracture has occurred, meaning that it often has to be managed surgically. So now on to management. And if we start with the Weber A fractures, we explained that these are often considered the easiest to treat, there's the least ankle instability with these injuries, and thus they can be managed conservatively with either a plaster of Paris or an orthopedic boot to immobilize the ankle. And the ankle is immobilized for around about three to six weeks. During that process, the consultant will bring the patient back for a repeat x-ray to check for healing. And if everything's okay, the plaster of Paris can come off and the patient can start their physiotherapy. So your Weber C fractures are on the opposite end of the scale to this. Your Weber C fractures are going to be the most unstable. As we said, a syndesmosis injury occurs 100% of the time 
with these fractures from the research and therefore we're going to need surgical fixation in order to manage these patients. So you're going to see that these patients are going to have either a metal plate or a series of screws in order to unite the fracture and to rebind the tibia to the fibula. Now we'll also see that these patients may have a different weight-bearing status. They might often be managed non-weight-bearing in the early stages or perhaps partial weight-bearing in the early stages based on how much the surgeon has had to do in order to fix the fracture. So what about your Weber B fractures? How are they managed? Well, that depends on the severity of the syndesmosis injury and thus on the degree of ankle instability. And this can be assessed in the early stages via the x-ray. So your surgeon may well look at your patient's x-ray to analyze the degree of Taylor shift. So Taylor shift represents the amount that the talus has shifted out of that mortise lock position. As we said, if there's a syndesmosis injury, the tibia and the fibula will separate, leaving the talus where it can shift. Now, Delco et al. found that a one millimeter increase in Taylor shift can decrease contact between the tibia and the talus by up to 42%. So it just highlights how even a small amount of shift can lead to a big amount of instability. If your surgeons see that Taylor shift on the x-ray, they're much more likely to go down the surgical fixation route, whereas if there's no Taylor shift, they can go down the conservative immobilization with a plaster of Paris or orthopedic boot route. So guys, some top tips that you can use in practice today to help with these patients. Number one, make sure that your patient's pain is under control by using adequate pain relief. This means that they're gonna engage much more confidently in your rehabilitation. So make sure that they've consulted their doctor or their surgeon in order to prescribe them the medication they need to get their pain levels under control. Top tip number two is to make sure that you explain and reassure your patient that in line with the orthopedic weight bearing instructions, it's good for them to put weight through their ankle. Not only is this really good for healing of the bone, but it's also going to start to use those muscles and therefore get the patient back on track faster. And if they didn't start weight bearing at the right time, their recovery is likely to be longer. And top tip number three is look out for that dorsiflexion block. One of the things that I found the most from practice with these patients is that dorsiflexion in a weight bearing position tends to be one of the most challenging for the patients to regain in the early stages. So that's when they're in dorsiflexion and weight bearing going down the stairs, for example. So Ways that you can easily manage this is by getting them to do lunges on a step where their injured foot is placed on a step and then they're gently moving into a dorsiflexion position because that higher position means slightly less weight bearing. And then as they get better at that, get them to lunge on lower steps or even on a flat ground. And that's how you can progress from that challenging dorsiflexion position and making it a little bit easier. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, we'd be super grateful if you can smash that like button. And if you want even more from us, then check out our website at clinicalphysio.com. My name is Khalid Maidan. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you here really soon on Clinical Physio.